Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us online today for another in the Human Rights Campaign series of Global Conversations. Our televisions are full of images of the world's crises, from Haiti to the southern border, to floods, to hurricanes, COVID, and more. And recently, of course, the August takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, following the collapse of the army and government of that country. And just this weekend, we saw more numbing images of the Taliban's brutal rule, just as so many had predicted. The Taliban's rise to power has focused international attention on the safety and livelihood of many vulnerable populations in Afghanistan, including women and girls, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex Afghans. Now, same-sex sexual conduct was already criminalized before the Taliban took control, but the new regime's mandate to reel with, rule with Sharia law makes the fate of LGBTQI Afghans even more precarious, subjecting them to the very real possibility of death. There are already alarming reports from LGBTQI Afghans about their fear of living under Taliban rule, with many saying that they've gone into hiding in fear of their lives. An exodus of LGBTQI refugees has commenced and will likely expand. Today, we're going to explore what are the fears of LGBTQI Afghans and what life is like living under the Taliban. We will focus on what you, as citizens, can do and must do to urge our governments to do more to protect these people and to ensure that they do not just become more awful statistics. We will look at specific measures that can be taken to save lives and how you can help. And to do this today, we have an awesome panel. Let me introduce our panelists for the afternoon. First, I want to welcome Mark Bromling, who is chair and co-founder of the Council for Global Equality, a powerful coalition of US-based organizations that advocate for an inclusive US foreign policy. Mark is an international human rights lawyer and a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law and the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Hello, Mark, and welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. Next, we have Kamali Powell, who is the executive director of Rainbow Railroad, an amazing organization which helps to resettle LGBTQI refugees all around the world. Kimali is a longtime advocate for social justice who has spent over 20 years advancing the rights of youth, the African Caribbean and black community, people living and affected by HIV and the LGBTQI community. He's a graduate of the University of Ottawa and holds an honorary doctor of laws from the University of Victoria. Welcome Kimali. And last but certainly not least, we welcome Nimat Sadat, who is an Afghan-American journalist, novelist, and human rights ad activist. He is the author of The Carpet Weaver and an LGBTQIA rights activist in Afghanistan and Muslim communities worldwide. While teaching at the U American University in Afghanistan, he was deemed a national security threat for his LGBTQIA activism. Nimat holds graduate degrees from Harvard, Columbia, Oxford, and Johns Hopkins, and we Honored to welcome him here. Hello, Nimat. Shortly, we will be joined by Congressman Chris Pappas, um, who will talk about what he's doing on Capitol Hill. But in the meantime, let's jump right into the conversation. So I'm going to start with Nimat. Um, we have read much about the danger that the Taliban pose to LGBTQIA Afghans. Can you briefly outline what is the nature of the threat that they face and why Afghan LGBTQI people are afraid for their lives in the current situation? The, right now, um, LGBTQI people in Afghanistan are the most vulnerable people in the most dangerous country uh, right now. And I, I don't, it's not hyperbolic to say, you know, to say what, uh, what, what the Taliban are doing and will continue to do is nothing short of what the Nazis did. It is the complete extermination of an entire community. 
Um, and they're going to do that by implementing Sharia law. And they have already done that. And what's really taken a, a big twist of fate from the sources on the ground that have come to me, they said that these public executions in the name of like kidnappings and other heinous crimes that the Taliban have committed, they're saying that those are actually members of the LGBTQI community, but they're passing it as other crimes just to get the rally the support. And they don't want, they don't, they know that if they kill homosexuals and, and transgender people, that the, the, there's going to be an international outcry against the Taliban. So we face a, a, a you know, menacing group of people, tyrannical terrorists that are bent on the destruction of our, of our community. And uh, there's there, there's no resources for them. There is no there is no safe house. There is no LGBT center. There is no there's nobody to plead to. The few allies that we had, they're now turning against them. Basically, uh, the Taliban are coming into communities and saying, "Hand us over your LGBTQ people." And anybody who cooperates gets a social credit. Anybody who does not, they will receive the same punishment that the same punishment that our, the LGBTQ people get, which is an imminent death. Mullah Gul Rahim in July, uh, basically, this is before the withdrawal, this is before the fall of Kabul, this is before everything was handed over, vowed that other people will be given amnesty. And we know that that's not the truth, that, you know, like interpreters and journalists and other people who the Taliban have been targeting uh, will be given amnesty. But with, with, with the members of the LGBT community, they didn't even, they didn't even make a promise to even give an amnesty. They were very clear that is the only fate that they will receive is uh, either a toppling of walls by 10 to, feet, 10 to 15 feet tall or stoning, and there's nothing else. And that's exactly what we've been seeing on the ground uh, with people, uh, with, you, know, uh, you know, with the people that, that, that I serve and have been continuing to serve uh, for the last decade as, as, a, you know, as, as a leading LGBTQI rights activist. Well, thank you. And we'll come back and I'm sure we'll be able to hear even more details uh, about the situation. Um, let me ask you, Mali, you know, when Rainbow Railroad, which works to help LGBTQI refugees all around the world, what did you do when you first became aware of the situation of, in Afghanistan and what were some of the challenges you faced? Yeah, thanks uh, for having me and thanks for the question. You know, Rainbow Road currently fields uh, between three and 4,000 requests for help each year uh, all around the world. And I think what's remarkable about this current situation is I think we have to acknowledge that it's in part um, a consequence of governments kind of not um, really foreseeing or planning um, the inevitable displacement that would happen with the withdrawal of U.S. forces and the fall of Kabul. And, and one of the things that we've long advocated for is, uh, for multiple countries in the, in the United States, is a crisis response plan for this very reason. Uh, because um, how extraordinary, how extraordinary is it that, you know, um, Namat is, and other folks are placed in this position to have to protect uh, hundreds, of, if not thousands, of LGBTQI Afghans who are displaced right now. Uh, and so, really, our organization, um, you know, looked closely at what was happening on the ground, and um, it was actually partially because governments announced LGBTQI persons of concern of vulnerable groups. Uh, during the period between the fall of Kabul and the withdrawal that people just started to approach us. Um, and, and so uh, doing so, we try to see how we can help. One of the challenges for us um, prior to the fall of Kabul is that uh, Rainbow Railroad works, uh, seeks to work jointly with LGBTQI organizations, human rights defenders on the ground. Uh, and in the, the in Afghanistan, it, it was even before the Taliban took over. It was organizing was difficult, um, and I think we saw a further displacement and people leaving and and you know shutting down their organizations both, like during that period of time. So what we sought to do is try to build any sort of coalitions uh, in order to try to 
get people out who are evacuating. Uh, for and and one of the challenges uh, for the LGBTQI community out of Afghanistan fleeing is that it's not it's not like neighboring countries are safe havens either. Uh, and so being really careful not to further um, displace someone uh, or relocate someone to uh, another place that is also dangerous for them. And so we continue to look at opportunities to um, evacuate persons, um, working with civil society, activists, governments, um, ensuring that there's a safe country to eventually resettle persons, and then ensuring that governments actually have a short, medium, and long-term plan to actually deal with people at risk. So along those lines, thanks. Um, I'm going to ask Mark this question. I mean, clearly we were all shocked by the images of, you know, thousands of refugees desperate to leave the country, trying to get onto those last American planes. Um, and then, you know, the, the issue of what was happening to folks when they arrived here. I mean, I think everybody was caught by surprise and governments were caught by surprise by the speed of the collapse um, of the Afghan army and state and, and the, you know, Taliban takeover and the resultant refugee crisis. Can you explain why the U.S. refugee system is in such disarray following the previous administration um, and why it's so important to fix it? Sure. Thanks, Jean. Um, I think you're right. We were all horrified watching the scenes unfold at Kabul airport. And clearly that was a massive intelligence failure, right? The United States did not anticipate Kabul to fall so quickly. They did not, we did not anticipate the Afghan army to simply disappear um, and the president to, to leave within a matter of hours. So, so everyone was caught off guard um, at, at the rapid pace of the, the fall of Kabul. Um, and we weren't prepared for it and it was utter chaos. But I think it's also important to understand sort of where the US refugee was, program was at that moment in time. So under the Trump administration, um, Trump administration essentially shut down our US refugee program. So historically, the United States has been one of the most uh, generous countries in terms of resettling refugees to the United States. And we historically have resettled somewhere around 100, 125,000 refugees a year. Um, toward the end of his presidency, President Trump set the cap at 15,000 persons. And even that was not, uh, um, uh, was not real because through bureaucratic means and justifications based on COVID, the entire program was essentially shut down. So when the Biden administration came back in, um, they had to essentially resuscitate the U.S. refugee program. They had to restaff it. Offices that are important to the security vetting were shut down. Um, we, we simply didn't have the staff or the capacity to resettle people in the first months after the Trump administration. Slowly, the Biden administration has been rebuilding that capacity, but we were in the very early stages of rebuilding the U.S. refugee program when the crisis at Kabul hit. And we were not prepared to resettle tens of thousands of refugees into a program that had been completely decimated by the Trump administration. Um, the administration has tried a lot of creative fixes to bring people to third countries to process, to process through humanitarian visas instead of refugee visas. There's There's been a lot of effort to try to deal with the crisis, but the reality is the U.S. refugee program was completely broken, and it's really important that um, medium and long term, we look at opportunities to fix that program because that program is the lifeline we need for this, these sorts of crisis situations uh, involving mass migration. Well, you're right. I mean, we need those lifelines so that we can avoid the situations that we saw playing out over the last few weeks. Um, Nima, you've been in, in touch with LGBTQ people uh, across Afghanistan, desperate to get out. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what some of them were experiencing in their efforts to to leave? Yeah, I mean, it's it's horrific. I mean, what they're experiencing, like, you know, I I say this like right now they're in like Anne Frank like conditions, hiding in basements, in closets, and rooftops 
doing whatever they can to not to expose themselves because during the last decade or even the last 20 years, um, they were exposing themselves in the sense that they were quasi out. They were trying to push the envelope for social progress for LGBT, even though Afghanistan homosexuality was illegal, right? And so now they are worried that they're on the Taliban hit list um, and that any kind of, that, that anybody, their neighbor, their friends, even in some cases, their, fam their own families are writing them out. I mean, I have one person whose own father is basically is just collaborating with the Taliban and trying to hunt down his son. And this son is like, this is it's so devastating because he has absolutely nowhere to go. Um, and he is also an ethnic and religious minority too. So he has like, he's, he's triple, you know, triple a threat. And it's just like, you know, you have so many people that have so many different lives that are, that are the intersection of these, of all their issues are just, just all magnifying on top of each other. I just, you know, one person who is, who goes by the name of Ahmadullah, he has seen so much horror, half of his family getting killed by the Taliban. His, on the day that the Taliban took over Kabul, his own boyfriend was beheaded. And he's been on the run. He's had now three instances of evading capture, and all, each of those times he's been brutally beaten and 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 and, and, and wounded and stabbed. Uh, and it's just like it's like taking these people are now not just going from, not just going from like within district from within the city. They're actually going, and this is not just like exclusive to the LGBTQI community. This is across Afghanistan. People who cannot get out of Afghanistan, they're literally going from province to province, region to region, so that hopefully in the hope that the people in a different part of the country will not recognize who they are, who will not know who they are, will not know their history, and will hopefully will not report them to the Taliban. So, but, but what about the people who don't have those resources? They don't know what they are. So with the LGBTQI community, not only were they, are, they didn't receive much of this financial aid and support that came. They were already considered illegal. So they're already on the fringes of society. And it's like now it's like they have absolutely no social support. Like if it wasn't people like Rainbow Railroad and myself and other nominees trying to be their advocates, they would have they would pretty much perish. Like the only reason why they're they're still alive right now is because they're thinking, well, you know what? There's some hope. There's somebody out there for advocating for me, trying to get my voice across. You know, in this last decade, when I tried to get members of the LGBT community to come and speak with journalists, they were really scared. Like, for example, after the Orlando massacre, when, you know, uh, Omar Martin, the African-American turned ISIS terrorist, went and killed people, people wanted, people journal, people in the U.S. media and international media were like, we want to speak to members of the LGBT community. And nobody wanted to speak. It was like so hard. I would need to ask like hundreds of people to get one person to say yes, right? And now it's the exact opposite. Everybody wants to get the story heard. No one is refusing to speak to a journalist. Everyone's like, you know what? We're, we're going to die anyways. We don't want our, our life to go in vain. We want our stories to get told. We want the world to know. We want the world to care about LGBTQ Afghan people, that we're humans too, that we deserve to be equal, that we deserve to be, we deserve the same dignity as everybody else. Even though the world, the rest of the world hates us, they don't want us. They don't. They think that we're to keep us out of sight, out of mind. But no, our life does matter. We do want to live, and maybe somebody, somebody out there will do something to change our fate, so that maybe we can get our freedom. And that's that's where they're at right now. They're grasping on that last breath, and they're hoping that somebody will say yes. Mm -hmm. And mind you, that that the Taliban they see them as the worst creatures according to the ideology that they believe in, because homosexuals are considered. Uh, you know, homosexual is, is a work, work, cardinal sin because of homo being homosexual, being apostate, and being a sodomite. So there's there's no way for negotiation. And and this is, I think, one of the this is the one thing that's really upsetting for the really the LGBTQI community is like, how could the United States and our, our the international community not only abandon us, but how could they even negotiate with people and not even say ensure even guarantee our basic existence? So, I mean, it, this whole premise was flawed and, and false from the very beginning. And I think that they're just basically, they're like, they're, there's, they're, there's just like very little hope for them. But I'm trying to tell them, no, there are people who care. There, I'm, every, I'm, I'm in contact with them um, in many ways, many methods. And I'm constantly telling them, no, you got to keep going. You got to keep alive. And you got to keep your, kind of trying to keep your spirits up. And I think that now the, the pendulum is shifting. There is a growing movement that's happening. And I think people are realizing that, no, 
whatever happens to LGBTQI community in Afghanistan could very well spread throughout Central Asia to the Western world. You know, we have to make sure if Afghanistan goes dark for LGBTQ people, then it threatens the LGBT community everywhere. And I know that's not hyperbolic to say, and I think that's why we're all here and speaking today, because we know we know these threats can, can spread very easily. This radicalism can easily spread to neighboring countries, which is like, as Kamali mentioned, which is already hostile towards LGBT people. And once it gets a foothold in the world, then, it, then there's nowhere gonna be safe. Everywhere LGBT people will be hiding from these kind of fanatical people, and there's nobody gonna be left to protect them. Thank you. Well, there is, there is hope because there are people out there who do care and folks who are working really hard to try to help them. Um, Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about what's been going on here in the U.S. with the citizens' movement to urge the U.S. government to do thing, something that will protect Afghans inside and outside and helping them to get out from Afghanistan? Sure. For those who haven't seen it yet, um, we do have a 10-point plan that, that we've all developed together um, and in coordination with other uh, refugee resettlement agencies. Um, and we would urge you to, to look at that 10-point plan, to sign your name to that 10-point plan. But basically what it is at its core is uh, a political document calling on the United States to, to um seize the moment, show some political leadership, and commit to supporting and resettling at-risk LGBTQI Afghan uh, refugees. Now, we realize there's there's not as much that the United States can do right now in terms of evacuations, um, although certainly any support is still welcome. But the, um, the good news, uh, if you can call it that, is that slowly there are at-risk LGBTQI Afghans who are starting to get out of Afghanistan, um, crossing into into other countries in the region, getting on flights that are that are starting to resume from the Kabul airport, and we need to ensure that the U.S. government and other friendly governments are ready to receive those individuals once they cross into a third country and that we can process them for uh, refugee resettlement um, as safely and quickly as possible. Um, the, the 10 point plan recognizes that in many cases, these refugees will not be safe in the third country that they immediately cross into, um, that we may need to relocate them to safer countries where they, their refugee claims can be fully explored and processed, where we can um, conduct full vetting to ensure uh, safety and security for individuals who do come to the United States or, or other friendly countries. Um, but the bottom line is we need to invest the funds and the political capital right now to meet these refugees as they're starting to come across the border. We can't abandon them again once they manage to get out of Afghanistan. Thank you, Mark. Um, so talking of finding ways to protect LGBTQ Afghans, one of the main parts of this petition that you've mentioned is a call to expand um, special protections for them as refugees. And it's not only civil society that's calling for that. Um, US Congress is also doing so. And we're uh, being joined now by Congressman Chris Pappas from New Hampshire, who recently led on a letter, a dear colleague letter to other, uh, with other members of Congress to Secretary Blinken, urging him to expand special protective status to LGBTQI refugees from Afghanistan. Um, welcome, Representative Pappas. We honored that you could join us today and we look forward to hearing from your remarks. Hi everyone, I'm Congressman Chris Pappas from New Hampshire. Thank you for joining us today for HRC's panel, Taking Action for LGBTQI Afghan Refugees. I'm honored to be here with you all to kick off this discussion about a pressing issue that couldn't be more important to the lives of thousands of people. I wanna thank HRC for holding this and for many other important discussions, as well as to the panelists today, Mark Bromley from the Council for Global Equality, Kamali Powell from the Rainbow Railroad, Namat Sadat, an incredibly brave LGBTQI Afghan American activist, and our moderator, Gene Friedberg, HRC's Director of Global Partnerships. 
Like all of us, I watched the events in Afghanistan with a heavy heart. They were devastating to see unfold. And we all remain deeply concerned for the safety, the well being, and the livelihoods of those who remain in Afghanistan under Taliban rule. We must do all we can to ensure the safety and security of US citizens and our Afghan allies and partners who stood with us for over two decades. We must do all we can to ensure the safety and security of women in Afghanistan who, under control of the Taliban, have already seen their liberties and freedoms eroded and their lives are placed in jeopardy as a result. And we must do all we can to ensure the safety and security of LGBTQI Afghans. With the Taliban's takeover of the country, LGBTQI Afghans face the prospect of a violent death. Sharia law already cemented in Afghanistan's constitution prohibits all forms of same-sex activity and makes same-sex activity punishable by death. Just as it was for ISIS in Iraq, Sharia law is the Taliban's guiding compass as it solidifies its rule over Afghanistan's government and society. That's why I led 63 of my House colleagues in a letter to Secretary Anthony Blinken, urging him to expand the State Department's priority two designation to grant LGBTQI Afghans access to the United States Refugee Admissions Program. While the United States evacuated thousands of Afghans before the withdrawal, LGBTQI Afghans continue to live in fear. The United States has the power to protect the lives of countless individuals who uh, face uh, living under a regime that threatens their very existence. And we've got to use that power for good. This is not some abstract threat to LGBTQI Afghans. This is a clear and present danger. In July, a Taliban judge promised that once Taliban forces had taken over the country, that they would implement Sharia law and seek to prosecute and execute LGBTQI Afghans. He said, and I quote, for homosexuals, there can be two punishments, either stoning or he must stand behind a wall that will fall down on him. I know that should chill us all to our core. And if there are those who don't understand the danger or need further persuading, I urge them to simply read the words and hear the stories of LGBTQI Afghans themselves. Layla, a transgender woman in Afghanistan says, quote, I am terrified. It's like a nightmare. I don't feel safe even in my room. I'm scared of the Taliban. When I see them, I feel they will know who I am and they will come to beat me, kick me or send me to prison. As it has been reported in the international press, some transgender women are growing beards while lesbians have said they are feeling under pressure to be quote, more feminine. Sunita, a lesbian says, quote, if they found out that I'm a girl and a lesbian, it will make them angry. They can rape and kill me, says Sunita. A group of Taliban uh, with guns, she continues, came to my house after I left my home. They spoke to my family and told them to reveal my whereabouts. Otherwise, they will punish everyone. While the Biden administration has been a champion of LGBTQ plus rights in the United States and abroad, in the face of the current reality in Afghanistan, more is needed, and it's needed now. Canada announced on August 14th that it would resettle more than 20,000 Afghan citizens with an emphasis on protecting LGBTQI Afghans, women, and others typically targeted by the Taliban. The United States has yet to announce any such policy for policy for LGBTQI Afghans. That's why we're urging them to do just that and why I'm so grateful of the work of HRC and the panelists here today to keep this conversation going. We have to better understand this crisis and help us work toward a resolution that protects LGBTQI Afghans and their families. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and we appreciate your efforts uh, to keep this issue alive. So let me ask um, Kamali a question. We've now heard some of the things which we can do as citizens, um, but let me ask you, what are the five top things that citizens out there listening and others can do to help expedite passage for LGBTQ refugees from Afghanistan, protect them while they're there, and help them in the resettlement process once they get to other countries? 
Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Uh, um, so I think, first of all, um, you know, signing on to the 10 point plan is a simple and effective thing that uh, all HRC members can do to ensure that the Biden administration understands that there is a large amount of members of the LGBTQI community here in the United States that uh, demand that uh, actions are taking place in order to protect people at risk. Uh, of course, also, there's a, a one of the silver linings about this in many crises is that there are people who are willing to step up and help. And if you go to welcome.us, uh, there's a coalition of organizations, civil society members uh, that are ready to step up and help protect persons at risk. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, if you you're listening to Matt Dinamat, you know that uh, there, this situation has requ required folks to uh, do some pretty extraordinary uh, so, uh, activism and support of people whose lives are at risk. Uh, and so, you know, following them out and understanding firsthand, listening to what's actually happening to people at risk is really crucial um, to really understand uh, just how dire the situation is for Afghans. Um, uh, that's the third thing. Um, of course, you know, you uh, many people at HRC are friends of Rainbow Railroad, uh, continue doing supporting um, our work and following the situation widely, uh, but not just in Afghanistan. And I, and I really want to stress this uh, because, you know, uh, it's one thing to really be concerned about the situation in Afghanistan and in other countries while it's um, in the media, but it's most important that you continue to pay close attention to these crises when it's not. Because when the, the, when the US media turns its attention away from Afghanistan, the people who are still there are gonna be further displaced and actually in more danger. And that leads to my fifth and final point is that the time for action is now. And I'm gonna say this very clearly so that the membership can understand that governments have the power to move on this now. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm gonna, I agree with everything that Mark says, but I'll make it a, a slight adjustment that yes, while the tools are limited at the moment, there are still tools at the US's disposal. Uh, and the biggest tool right now is actually picking out the phone, calling them out and others, and understanding that civil society has referred hundreds of people for immediate relocation. That's the biggest actual lift is identifying people for the tools that we have at the disposal. And so one thing that every single person who's listening to this can do right now is call your lawmaker and tell them to put pressure on Secretary Blinken to use all the tools at the disposal to partner with civil society members and organizations who can who can refer and identify people at risk right now for immediate resettlement into the United States. Thanks, Kimali. Let me just ask you a quick follow-up. Um, one of the things that Rainbow Railroad does is you also work with people who are being resettled in this country. Um, what, um, what are some of the things that US citizens can do um, if LGBTQI Afghans come to their community? What can they do to invite them and to help them? I know some of this is on that fabulous uh, website, welcome.us, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about that as well in the US and in other third countries. So there's many tools the US has at its disposal to help resettle refugees. Um, I think there needs to be opportunities for just immediate referrals uh, into the United States and find uh, mechanisms to do that. But one, one tool that will likely be at um, our disposal is uh, one that, that needs individuals in the United States to help sponsor and support people who arrive. I think we all recognize that being a refugee is hard. And being an LGBTQI refugee is particularly hard, especially in the United States. 
especially, uh, you know, in metropolitan areas where, um, you know, support for LGBTQI people who are from the United States is difficult. And so what we should be preparing for, no matter where you are in the country, is can you, are you willing to help receive and support LGBTQI persons? That means potentially helping sponsor individuals and our friends at Immigration Equality and other organizations are really looking at tools to allow uh, citizens to come to the United States, be partnered with a sponsor or welcoming community. But that means resources. That means you got to understand, you know, if you, you know, following up the things that Namat was saying, you could understand that when, if a person has managed to escape, once they arrive to the United States, they're going to have nothing on their person, right? They fled under duress. Uh, and that means real support uh, to help with the trauma um, from escaping um, death and violence, um, just to help rebuild their lives and to adjust to being a citizen of the United States. Thank you. So there are things that people can do. So I think that's important. I think there are things that people can do. And, the, and, and you know, being silent is not one of them. That's probably the biggest message. So as we wrap up our conversation, um, Nimat, I'm going to ask you, what are your final thoughts about how these steps will might give hope to LGBTQ Afghans who are still inside the country and who may be either looking, you know, and looking to get out or if they can't in the short run, knowing that there are options for them going forward? Yeah, I mean, you know, as every day passes, you know, Afghanistan, I kind of liken it, it's becoming like an Islamic North Korea. You know, every day that the borders are getting sealed, uh, you know, the, the communication and also the, both the internet and mobile communication, the Taliban are tampering that. We saw that, in like, for example, in Pangshir province, they completely shut it down. So they're, they're tapping into these LGBT groups. Um, they're tracking members of LGBTQI community by geolocation. Uh, I know this because several people in my group who escaped, evaded capture, they were tracked even after they were hiding. So when people say like, why didn't they get out? Why are they still there? They How would they do that? <laughs> you know, it's very impossible. A lot of these people do not even have passports. So they don't even have valid passport. How does a transgender person who has on their passport male go to a passport office once the Taliban it starts issuing passwords that's recognized and say, hey, I would like to get a passport and then looks like a female, they turn themselves in. They're gonna get it, that's like a death with. So when people say, you know, how, why didn't they, why did they wait to the last minute? They should have left before. It was not possible to leave before. LGBTQI people were being deported even if they reached Europe because they said, you came from a liberated country. You came, we went and liberated Afghanistan. There's NATO there, there's US there. And we know that's not true. They were still being persecuted quietly uh, and killed and fined and imprisoned and raped and all those horrific stories. But now it's like, at least under that regime, they could find a way, a way to, to get out here. There's no outlet. So at least right now, if this 10 point plan gets passed, it will ensure them, like it will give them some hope that, you know what, if there's it's like a lifeline of support, if we can manage somehow, muster up whatever willpower and resources we have to get out of this country, even to a hostile neighboring country, then you know what? Then we can survive, we'll be able to make it. Otherwise, it's like, if we don't pass this plan, it's like they're, they're just gonna start giving up. And when we're talking about how many people, if, like the Kinsey study says about 10% is, is LGBTQ. So in a country of 40 million people, we're talking like upwards of 4 million people. And so the, the, the list that you know Rainbow Railroad has, my, my list of about 450 people and Rainbow Railroads and everybody else's, this is like, a little over a thousand people. So we're just scratching the surface. We're not even like, we're at 0.01% of what the potential of the LGBTQI community is. But these are the people who are at who are the front lines and fighting and championing for LGBTQI rights. If they get out, they can be a force multiplied. They can be provide so much uh, oxygen for the people inside the country. They can help do, they can, they can do the work that we're doing and, and support their friends, their communities, their comrades. So that's all I'm asking for. I have a GoFundMe page that I've started. If you would please, or I urge you, every dollar you spend, every donation you make, whether small, big, it really will go a long way. You can find it on my social media pages. Um, I would really uh, need your support because a lot of organizations are swamped. Everybody's dealing with an entire country falling. So 
um, a lot of these organizations, it's like they're telling us, you know what, we can't really support LGBT community because we're already helping other people. So the LGBT community, at the end of the day, has to be, sadly to say, it has to be LGBT people coming to the rescue of LGBTQ people. Because if we don't support our own community, we can, no one else is going to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Nimat. Um, a plea from the heart. And I think the message that comes from this panel overall is that you can do something. The time is now. There are organizations that desperately need your help. There are things which you as individuals can do. You can sign that petition, go to that website, welcome.us. So many resources there, what you can do. Listen to activists like Namat. Call your lawmakers. Call on them to push the US to take every step to identify and refer people and get them out, the folks who want to come out. So do something and do it now. I think that is the call that's emerging from this conversation. I want to thank each one of our panelists, Mark, Nimat, Kimali, so much for joining us today, for giving of yourselves, for the work that you do every day. I want to thank all the folks behind the scenes who helped make this conversation possible. And I want to thank each one of you, the viewers out there, for being here, for being present, for listening, and above all, for taking action. Thank you very much. And good day, good evening, good night to you all.